Will the Man of Steel's dream of a brand new forward-thinking superhero team meant to combat newer, more dangerous problems die on the vine before it even bears fruit? Well, let's hop into the pages of Superman and the Authority issue number four and find out together, shall we? So then, picking up from where the last issue had left off, Superman had been blindsided and kidnapped by the ultra-humanite who plans to scrape out his brain and put his own in the Man of Steel's body. Humanite actually goes on a fairly interesting little rant here where he talks about being one of Superman's most original villains. In fact, he predates the likes of Luthor and Brainiac, which, when we stop and think about it, means he's also probably one of the original codifiers for the mad scientist archetype in literature, but it doesn't matter how evil or smart the humanite is, because Superman has just managed to outplay him in this instance. You see, the humanite thought it would be easier to do his surgery in the bottle city of Kandor. What he didn't notice was is that Clark turned off the Kryptonian atmosphere generator, meaning that he still has his strength. Degraded though it might be, it's still enough to defeat the humanite. And even if it wasn't, Superman doesn't have to fight alone. Lois is there too, and she's packing laser gun heat. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably wondering, wait, why does Superman look so much older and Lois looks like she hasn't aged a day? When exactly does this story take place in continuity? The answer is eh, complicated and a little confusing, but I'll try and touch on that near the end. Superman zeroes on into the fact that the Ultra Humanite was using amazingly complex technology generations beyond what he normally uses, and even for a super genius, that's saying something. Obviously, the Humanite and the other cadre of villains we've been following all series long haven't been working alone. They have themselves a mysterious benefactor in the form of Brainiac, but not just any Brainiac, Brainiac living in the body of Lex Luthor. Again, you might be asking, when did this happen? Did you miss something? And all I can tell you is, hey, it's brand new for me too. Lexiac goes on a whole big tirade explaining what his ultimate goal was, and that is to try and save the Earth from itself and the invasive, destructive species known as humanity. For you see, Brainiac cannot complete his collection of worlds if Earth manages to destroy itself first. Uh, thanks, Brainiac, I guess? Superman, I gotta say, actually has a pretty interesting counterpoint to Brainiac this time, saying that Earth would probably be better served burning out and fading away than stuck forever unmoving and unevolving inside one of his glass jars. Now, going after Superman was always the main plan that the bad guys had put together, and everything they were doing in Dubai and LA was meant as smoke screens, but now Superman has completely flipped this plot on its head by managing to get out in front of it. And because still Superman is still trying to test his new newfound team in the field, he figures this is as good as any baptism by fire, so instead of joining them, he instead decides to stay back, and we get a big old finale wherein Superman and Brainiac move their different forces around the map like two godlike chess masters locked in an eternal duel. Now over in Dubai, the new authority is having to match wits with a newly assembled version of the Elite, complete with newer updated versions of weird forgotten supervillains. We got Iron Cross, an old member of a group called the Aryan Brigade, which everyone takes great pleasure in mocking, saying even by shitty Nazi supervillain standards, that's a pretty bad and generic name. There's Siv, an alien hacktivist who's here to give Natasha Irons a run for her money by hacking her suit. Don't worry, she always brings a spare. We also have Fleur de Lis, a French super spy and martial artist with body modifications that allow her to actually keep up with the enhanced Midnighter. We actually get a very fun little exchange here where Midnighter says, as well, you know, if I wasn't gay and already married, I would marry you just for the fights. Dali ends up admitting that she's gay too and says that it's so much fun to meet another queer person out in the field, even in supervillainous circles that rarely if ever happens, and then she gets punched out. And lastly, on this new team of do batters, we also have Coldcast, a former friend of Manchester Black and member of his old elite squad. Cast says that he got hired for this job and isn't really a fan of having to work side by side with a literal Nazi, but he also desperately wants to kill Manchester Black and up his villainous street cred. Now, while all this is going on, over in LA, Apollo and Enchantress are still trying to recruit the last member of their team, Light Ray. Apollo does battle with a new version of Omak, who, as we discover in this issue, actually has he, them, they pronouns, which is very good to know moving forward. Ultimately, Omak agrees to help the hero save Light Ray from the evil clutches of Eclipso. And hey, you know how Eclipso is normally shown as this, like, nigh on stop evil force that can take on entire super teams at once? Well, his only weakness is solar light, and Apollo is literally made of the stuff, so he's quite easy to take down. Once that fight is done, Apollo
Apollo and Enchantress are able to back up the rest of the team over in Dubai, and because Enchantress is so damn powerful, she decimates the entire robot army with a single spell. Luther and Humanite are naturally pissed about this turn of events and vow a bloody vengeance on Superman very soon, but in a hilarious change of pace, Clark essentially hangs up on them. If you've been reading the other books, you'll know that Superman's mind has been made up already. He assembled this team to go fix all the biggest problems in the universe, and that starts with fixing the slave problem on War World. Clark is perfectly content in the knowledge that his son John and all the other people who wear the House of L symbol will be more than able to defend Earth from the likes of Humanite and Luthor. And that he didn't assemble the authority just to get into more superhero, supervillain wrestling matches. They're going to actually change the universe one world at a time. Now that's where the main story ends, but we actually get a little backup story, this one showcasing Superman and Manchester Black having a much earlier meeting back when Superman was wearing his original costume. This bit here will really only make sense to you if you've been reading Philip Kennedy Johnson's other mainline Superman books. Clark talks about coming into possession of a piece of the source wall. An artifact of great power. Here's the thing though, the piece keeps calling out to him with one phrase over and over again. Light Ray is. A very clear and obvious reference to the old tagline Dark Side is, which means whoever Light Ray is, Superman and the rest of the team are going to be keeping a particular eye on her. And so that was Superman and the Authority issue number four, everybody. Yes, that's right, the series has come to a close after only four issues, which is crazy because I totally would have read this for four more. If I have any problems at all with this series, it's only because I'm trying to connect it to what's going on in the main Superman books right now, when honestly, I think that's an uphill and failing battle. Just don't do it. If recent interviews are to be believed, Philip Kennedy Johnson just decided to adapt some of the stuff in this story into his newest run, and you know what? Hey, why shouldn't he? This stuff is super cool. It is kind of weird, though, that Morrison chooses to end everything right here at the end only once the official Superman's authority team is assembled. Don't get me wrong, I think the idea of an older Superman changing the way he thinks and recruiting a super team to fight much more different problems than he would normally try and fix on the Justice League is a great idea and definitely works here in this story in four issues. It's just this issue ends up being a lot of Morrison build-up, but no actual Morrison payoff. You sold me on the concept of this cool new version of The Authority, and now I have to go follow their adventures somewhere else written by someone else where it might not even be the same dynamics that I've bought into. But again, I digress. Judging it solely on its own, this is a pretty damn cool four issues, which is why I would ultimately end up giving this issue an 8 out of 10. Hey there everyone, Kate Joel again, and I just want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. And hey, if you enjoyed the book I covered in this issue and want some comics of your own, might I recommend Book Depository? It's my number one place for shopping for comic book trades. You get a great price, and if you use my link down in the description, you'll actually be helping me out at the same time. You get something, I get something, everybody wins, right? So until next time, everyone, I've been Joel, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.